Computer, call Jim. Klingons do not use Uber. I better answer that. Hello, James here. Hello, Captain. Captain? Damn it, I'm an engineer, not a captain. Fascinating. It seems I have contacted the wrong James. Uh, yeah, and in the wrong time. How did you manage to send a message to the 21st century anyway? In the 23rd century, time travel is easy, yet voice commands still elude us. That being said, it is possible your hairless engineering skills can be put to use here. Bald. Not hairless. And what do you need anyway, Spock? I'm kind of busy here. All right, I'll cut to the proverbial chase. Captain Kirk has violated the temporal directive yet again. I'm not surprised. Starfleet has a bunch of vague directives. Yes, well, Captain Kirk has gone back in time to save humpback whales with Edith Keeler or something. This has caused tricorders to be erased from history. Our sensors can no longer detect the atmosphere of a planet, and we send down red shirts one after the other to die like so many canaries in a coal mine. Oh, because the atmosphere can't sustain human life. Nope. Cause of death is shirt color. James, you must build a tricorder and fix the timeline before more red shirts die. I'm absolutely positive that would have happened anyway, but you can consider me on the case. This is great news. I'm as thrilled as my logical nature will allow, which is not a lot since I'm Vulcan. <laughs> and I'm thrilled to be working with you, Spock. So let's get started. Amazing hacks. Inspired designs. Each week, Element 14 Presents brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wins. Wait. <laughs> Our 500th Element 14 Presents episode featured the Build Inside the Box competition. That's where Katie, Clem, and I competed to build a project using the same core parts. My entry was this Star Trek-inspired bald quarter. Following in the footsteps of the best TNG episode ever, Shades of Grey, we've gathered some footage to make an entire episode of that build. Now, even if you already watched the episode and the bonus content over on the Element 14 community, this video goes into more detail with new segments, like this one and the next one. Before I even got to the electronics, my first concern was, could I even make a tricorder-like thing? So I'm going to use this toy from my childhood as a model to see if I can duplicate this. The first issue I tackled was to make a hinge piece that opens and closes like the prop. This turned out, with the help of a protractor, to be a matter of cutting angles in a solid. From there, I had a body and flap. And the first iteration actually came out pretty good. It's about the same size and dimensions of the toy, which is when I realized I have to make it bigger, so I had to work on this a couple more times to get it to be the right size. I decided early on I would make the screen and button area removable faces. That way, if I need to change or fix something, I can just reprint a very small piece. Next, I had to figure out how to get wires between the two halves, because in the prop toy, there is no lights or buttons on the flap, but in my design, I want these to be touch sensitive, and this is where I want to put the speaker. Briefly, I considered just leaving the wires exposed. Fortunately, a couple of friends of mine on the Element 14 community gave me an idea for a hinge. Thanks guys. There's a hinge with an open cavity facing each other, and then holes on each body so that wires can make it all the way through. This design worked way better than I expected and I'm really happy with it. I did jump the gun a little bit. I started printing my iterations to get an idea of the size and scale. I had a ton of failed prints. So if I ever do this again, I'm definitely going to make it into multiple pieces. Okay, let's go talk about the electronics. For the electronics, we had to use eight specific parts. There was an Arduino Maker Zero for the microcontroller, a USB bank for power, a time of flight sensor, a photo interrupter, an op amp, an analog temperature sensor, Wago terminal blocks, and some OLED screens. I also added some NeoPixels and a five volt boost converter from Adafruit because I needed something to power the five volt stuff when running on battery, like the NeoPixels. Some of the parts were straightforward, like the temperature sensor. I just need to read an analog voltage, do some math, and get a temperature. But I decided for some of the other parts, I'd see if I could hack them to do something different. For example, I tore apart the battery pack and decided to only use one of its cells. Now, I'm not going to use its boost converter because those things are notorious for needing a load to stay on, and I didn't want to have to deal with that. I thought of using the time of flight sensor to measure distance, but I decided instead to use it for proximity to tell when the flap was open. Originally, I was going to design a dock. The tricorder would plug into it and then that would get it charged as well as provide a way to transfer data off the SD card. 
To do that data transfer, I thought of sending it across the photo interrupter. So for testing, I tried various baud rates and it actually worked surprisingly well to send serial data. But as I thought about it, I knew I wouldn't have time to make that dock, so I needed another way to use the photo interrupter. And that's when I thought of sanding off the daylight filter and using it as a light sensor, which in all of my testing worked really well. More on that later. One critical feature I knew I wanted was capacitive touch buttons, which seems to be a recurring theme for me in some of my projects. The Maker Zero has a SAMD21, which has a Q-Touch controller built in. It makes adding CapTouch to a project super easy, as long as you have a library for that Q-Touch controller. In the code, you just assign an analog pin and then you can read a sensitivity value. To make the actual touch zones, I printed a bracket and then wrapped some wire around where I want the buttons to be. My initial test looked really good, so then I redesigned the touch panel to have four buttons and be a little bit cleaner. I was a little bit concerned because the wires for the touch buttons run right next to the speaker wires. I thought they might interfere with each other. Spoiler, it works fine. I would, however, make a PCB if I was to do this again. I'd rather have a PCB that has the touch buttons and then the controller on that, and then use something like I2C to talk to the Arduino. Okay, this is the last day I have to work on the project. So right now, outside, the plastic pieces are drying. I've sanded them, primed them, and painted them, and they should be ready, hopefully, in a couple of hours. As with all my past projects, I realized I hit this peak where my desk is nothing but wires and parts laying around everywhere. And then eventually, it starts to clear up. I've moved most of the circuits into little modules that will go inside of the tricorder. Of course, now I'm thinking towards the future where it's going to be full of wires and I'm hoping that I have enough space, even though it's pretty big, but still, I'll bet I'm going to have trouble packing all the wires in. For the op-amp circuit, which provides sound to the circuit, I decided to make a small proto board. I just cut up a perma board that I have and then soldered the circuit directly onto it. The plan is to attach it to the top of the Arduino Maker Zero, which I'm going to have to remove all of the headers on so that everything will fit inside of the case. This also means that the op-amp circuit will probably have to go into the case last because it's got to go on top of everything else. So we'll see how that works out. One thing I've been trying to do as I build the modules is keep DuPont connectors so that I can keep testing them with the Arduino. However, for the LED screens, I accidentally cut both sides of the wire. So I'm lucky that I have the Wago terminal adapters because I can just use those to connect up my signals to the Arduino without having to mess around with twisting wires or soldering anything in. So in the final design, I'll have to find another way to make use of these terminal blocks, but at least I was able to use them during the build of the project as well. Originally for the light sensor, I was just going to solder wires directly to the phototransistor, but the wire broke. So I connected the sensor to a little board, that way I'd have a little bit of strain relief and a little bit easier time to plug it into something. That's going into the sensor bar, which will have the two sensors as well as the blinking LEDs because it's a Star Trek prop, so of course it has to have pointlessly blinking LEDs. The last major electrical thing I need to do is figure out the power situation. And so I'm going to work on that next where I'm going to try to power everything from the battery and make sure that it works. A Little bit nervous because I haven't tried up until now and I'm pretty much out of time. So let's see how this works out. Hi, I'm David from Element 14 to the Electronics Inside. Join me as I tear down toys, tools, appliances, modern, vintage, classics, and even some new releases just to find out what's inside. Of all of the clever tricks I've tried to pull with this project, 
getting sound out of the Arduino Maker Zero is my favorite. In fact, let me turn this off for just a second. The way this works is the Arduino Maker Zero has a digital to analog converter or DAC output. And so it can take digital samples and generate an analog waveform. So I have a wave file on the SD card, which makes the tricorder sound effect. I found a library for the Arduino, which will read the SD card at regular intervals, put the data into a buffer, and then play that data back out through the DAC at whatever the audio sample rate is, which in this case is 22 kilohertz. Now, this sounds like it would be pretty straightforward, but you have to remember that audio goes above and below zero volts, and this DAC can only output positive voltages. So there has to be a DC offset on the audio waveform in order for the DAC to be able to put out the full dynamic range. Also, the DAC has a limited current output, so it cannot drive this speaker directly. That's what I'm using the op amp for. It can buffer the DAC and drive enough current for the speaker to operate at a volume that we can actually hear. I did run into a problem though, but I saw a post on the Element 14 community that told me that this could be an issue. This op amp has a full rail to rail output. So in this case, it's powered by five volts. So the output can go pretty close to five volts. However, it has a limited common mode input range, meaning the input cannot be a full five volts. So I had to shift the voltage down a little bit from what the DAC was outputting. I did that using a DC blocking capacitor and then a voltage divider to reset or change the bias point before it goes into the op amp. As with all audio circuits, you can't really put DC into a speaker for a long period of time. Well, you can, you just burn a lot of power and sometimes ruin the speaker. So I had to add a DC blocking cap to remove the DC bias that I actually intentionally put on the signal. But you have to do this sometimes because like in a circuit like this, we don't have a negative voltage supply. So we had to keep everything positive until we got to the speaker. In terms of the sound effects, I found some tricorder sounds on the internet and I found one that I liked. It was also one that I felt like I could make a repetitive loop with, which I used some audio software to do just that, to make it seem like it's one continuous loop. And the result is a tricorder sound. Now this doesn't sound fantastic, it's got some issues, but I think in terms of trying to make sound using just the parts that were inside of the box, I mean, minus the speaker, this seems to work pretty well. I'm pretty happy with it, and I think it'll just add a little bit of extra charm to my tricorder project. So I've hit a situation that I thought I might hit and I was really hoping this wasn't going to be a problem, but it is. Everything doesn't fit in the case. So when I try to put the screens on right now, it's definitely hitting. And I know what's going on is inside the back of one of the OLEDs is actually hitting the op amp circuit. So because of where I'm at, that means I'm going to have to just remove the bottom OLED and move forward with it. I debated if I was going to do that or move the top one and move the other one up, but then I have to redesign this piece. And so if I just take that one screen out, it gives me a little bit of extra space and all I have to do is redesign the decal. So that's what I'm gonna do. So what I've got going on is all of the electronics are packed into the unit. I ran my DMM to make sure there's no shorts, no obvious shorts. Um, this does fit flush on, but I want it off because I'm gonna have to do some stuff to it afterwards anyway. So I'm gonna power it on with my multimeter. The only thing missing at this point is I haven't put the battery in yet. So the multimeter will act as the battery just in case there is something catastrophic. And frankly, if this works, nothing should happen because what's supposed to happen is the microcontroller should turn on and then immediately put everything to sleep. Although in this revision of the code, I can't remember if that's the case. So this is just a test to see if the power supply goes crazy, if anything explodes or shorts out, you know, just let's see what happens. Okay, it's only drawing um, 30 or 40 milliamps, which implies to me it the microcontroller must have turned on and shut everything down. So now I'm gonna go and uh, hook up my laptop and see what uh, what's going on over there.
I'm being very careful at the moment. I don't want to touch anything. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so this is still not working right. We'll deal with that in just a minute. But sound is working. That sounds really good. So sound is working. The OLED is working. Touch buttons are not but I might have those disabled? No. This is not the same code I thought it would be. Getting a clean final look was very important to me. So I spent a lot of time sanding, priming, and painting the 3D printed plastic pieces. I really wanted this project to pop. The problem is I suck at detailed painting. So I decided to make vinyl decals instead. Because of the boards on the OLED screens, there's a lot of dead space in the display panel. So I decided to fill it in with Elcar's graphics. And just like the panels in the show, almost everything is an Easter egg or a reference to something else. So let me know over on the Element 14 community if you figure them all out. My vinyl cutter has a print and cut feature. It adds registration marks to the artwork. So I printed this image out onto a thin vinyl sticker sheet. Then I loaded it into the vinyl cutter and let it cut. From there, it was just a matter of applying the new stickers to my bald quarter. I've taken everything in the box and I've turned it into a tricorder, or as I've been calling it, a bald quarter. I did add some LEDs so that we could get some nice fancy displays going on, but on the front panel, there are ports for the two sensors. So the temperature sensor works about as expected. It does bounce around a little bit, but it did that during testing, so no big surprise there. The light sensor, however, is not as sensitive as it used to be, but it still does detect light. So I'm calling it a daylight sensor at this point. I'm really happy with the way that the sound effect came out. And of course, I really like using the capacitive touch buttons to control everything. By the way, I even added a couple modes on the OLEDs so that it would be a little more interesting to look at. There's a random pattern for the light sensor. And then the temperature sensor can have some debug information, which even by itself, I think is pretty cool because it sort of reminds me of Star Trek with totally random numbers, even though they're not random because I know what they mean. Of course, the flap is fully functional because I'm using the time of flight sensor to see if the flap is open or closed. The whole thing is powered by a single cell from the USB power bank, which I connect it to the Arduino Maker Zero using those Wago terminal blocks. So we've got the Arduino, which uses the SD card for the sound, the Wago terminal adapters, the power bank, the time of flight sensor, the temperature sensor, and then the photo interrupter, which I turned into a light sensor. So I think I was able to use everything that was in the box to make the bulb quarter. Finally, something I wanted to do ever since I was a kid. Hmm. Hmm. Looks good to me. Remember that over on the Element 14 community, you can find the design files I used to build the bulb quarter. I have the code, the STLs, and the parts list that I used in my build. Well, I guess all that's left for me to do now is to send it to Spock. That's how 3D printers work, right? <laughs>